And good evening, everyone, and all the, every uh, audience. Good morning and good evening. Um, it's uh, welcome to the 20th uh, master talk uh, held by Design Wire and also Capital Land Raffle City Chongqing. And today's lecture is Mr. Mose Safadi, uh, who is rewarded, uh, renowned as a designer of the world best airport and other world class landmarks from the uh, evolution of the habitat housing con uh, concept designed unique to places and culture to humanize mega scale mr safety will bring us the design concept of the well-known projects such as the marina bay sand hotel in singapore and also the changi airport as well as in singapore and also rubber city in chongqing and also um, some projects uh, is just new uh, established in uh, uh, so let's welcome Mr. Mosey Safdi. So it's your time for the uh, sharing. And uh, uh, it's my honor to be host this lecture. And uh, your project inspired me a lot as a student and also as an architect and now as an academic. And um, one thing is, is worth men mentioning is that uh, before the COVID-19 epidemic, I just been to Singapore and to the Changi Airport. I spent a very great time uh, in Singapore and also in the Marina Bay, uh, with the hotel and with uh, everything in uh, Singapore. And thank you. Uh, good evening to you all in China from Boston. Um, it's uh, not as good uh, speaking on uh, on the uh, air on the zoom than seeing you face to face but in these uh, periods we need to uh, we need to communicate by any means we have so i thought today i would share with you uh, three dominant schemes that have uh, informed and dominated our work and uh, and and share some of the issues that have uh, preoccupied us. And it is it breaks down into three themes. The first is habitation, uh, how to rethink housing in high rise buildings, which is something I've been exploring uh, for the past 60 years. Uh, the second, not less important in the time of globalization is the power of place. Uh, how do we design buildings that belong to the places we're designing them? Uh, what does it mean to design in Beijing as differentiated from designing in New York or designing in cold uh, Montreal than in uh, the very hot uh, Dubai? Um, and for that matter, in very different cultures. And the third is the repossessive of the public realm. The public realm being the spaces of the city which we share, not the individual buildings, uh, not the individual structures and, and private places, but that which we come together as citizens, which is basically the essence of urbanism. So I will uh, take you on a journey uh, which begins in 1959 so i will take you on a, a journey Wait. which begins in 1959 uh, i was a student of architecture and we had i got a scholarship to study housing in north america mm -hmm. and i saw on our journey thousands and thousands of uh, families preferring to live in suburbs. This is Levittown, which was a famous suburban developer of much of the United States. And on the same trip, those who were poorer, who had less choice, were being housed by government housing, public housing, which seemed to me inhuman. They had no outdoor spaces. There was, the apartments had uh, only single orientations. They were served by double loaded corridors. And I came back determined to rethink the apartment building, to try and invent a new way in high density housing that is more humane, 
that gives us the quality of the suburban house in a high rise building. And this led to my thesis, which eventually translated in a great opportunity during the 1967 World's Fair to Habitat 67, a housing exhibit in which several ideas came together. One was prefabrication, how to produce housing in factories and assemble them into place, how to do so in a new free uh, geometry and uh, structural arrangements where every house has a garden, where ha we have no double loaded corridors, we have streets in the air, we have playgrounds. There's a great deal of open outdoor private and public space where landscaping and plant life are integral part of the living environment. The project, as you see it here, is as it is today, uh, 55 years later. It has proven to be an extremely successful community, a powerful community life. Uh, and the only question that remained was not if people prefer to live this way in high-rise buildings, but whether we can afford to, whether we can reproduce this. And for several years during the 1970s and 1980s, several attempts to build habitats in New York and Puerto Rico and Tehran and Jerusalem uh, did not go forward because there was a lot of resistance. Resistance to do with economics, with building systems, with codes, etc. As all this was happening, and we were actually focused more on institutional buildings, there was a great deal, a great transformation in cities. The densities that we were facing in the, in the mid 60s in cities around the world exploded. This is uh, Hong Kong a few years ago. Densities and mixed use projects that we could never imagine uh, in the 1960s. And you see here the kind of extreme density and the new challenges that we were wondering. Uh, habitat in Montreal, after all, was not an extreme density. It was just a medium high density. Could we meet the needs of today? And so we embarked on a research project about 15 years ago, in which we took Midtown New York, which you see here, with its density of approximately floor ratio coverage of 12. And we mapped it. You can see on the left side, the existing conditions, housing, offices, and some retail. And we rearranged it, as you can see on the right side, which is a reconfiguration of mixed use stacked structures where we achieved a similar density, but with a great deal of porosity. The structure is open so that it does not form walls in the city, barriers in the city, where many, many of the units enjoy private gardens. But as you can see on the 25th level above the office buildings, there is a continuous community street with the public realm extended up into the building itself where community life can occur on the ground and within the building itself. You see here in the detail of the rendering, the extent of the private outdoor spaces, the complete fractalization of the building uh, to connect the inhabitants with nature. And as often is the case, from research, you go to practice. From theoretical, you go to practical and real. And we have had the great uh, opportunity and uh, pleasure of seeing these ideas now being built in the marketplace by developers within the constraints of uh, of the current uh, real estate system. This project is in Qingguandao. Um, it is 
uh, it is built and inhabited for several years, uh, half of it. The other half is now expanding and under construction. It's along the coast. Many of the features of the habitat of the future, as you can see, are here. The stacking, the porosity, the availability of both public and private open to the sky spaces uh, for the community and the residents and the integration of plant life. And also the fact that it does not form a wall along the seashore and allows a city behind to enjoy uh, seeing right through it. We are now completing this. It was, a, it was our pleasure to collaborate with Kerry Development uh, with whom we have been working with the kind of innovation that uh, we could not achieve some years back. In parallel, in Singapore, this is also middle income housing built by Capital Land, the private developer, uh, not in the luxury area of downtown. Uh, 600 units, mostly families, in a structure that includes a series of bridges at various levels, which are completely devoted to community life with playgrounds and swimming pools and community rooms, uh, lots of terracing and all, every unit with its outdoor spaces uh, as well as its indoor spaces. And recently opened in Sri Lanka and Colombo, a 65 story singular tower, which with its series of terraces overlooking the Indian Ocean and the views, and again, trying to uh, create housing which is open and porous and in a structure that creates new opportunities in terms of its form and its articulation. I will change subject now and change scale because I want to talk about an issue that's equally urgent, I believe, which is to work towards an architecture which is rooted in place. Uh, we have seen a great deal of, great deal of, uh, similar sim uh, repetition or lack of distinction between environments in different cities and parts of the world. You travel, almost every airport looks the same, the same shops, the same brands. You have no idea which country you might be in. You can say the same about your typical urban mall. And certainly in terms of the architecture profession, it's been more an emphasis of its signature style than the signature of the place on the architecture. For me, this journey began working in Jerusalem in the 1970s, where I was involved in restoring and rebuilding part of the old city, which you see here. And in the quest of doing that, the question was, can we build contemporary authentic buildings which feel that they belong and uh, respect the architectural heritage of a historic city. Uh, across from the Western Wall, this seminary incorporates precast and stone construction. Uh, it is a school. Um, it sits in its setting as if it belongs. When we were asked to design this building, we were asked, would this be a modern building or a traditional building? And my answer was, if we succeed, you will not be able to answer the question. Also in Jerusalem, a residential district, which we designed, some of the forms echo the historic city, but there are contemporary enclosures of solariums and gardens and terraces uh, for the housing, combining traditional materials uh, with new ways of building. Some years later, we were commissioned to design the National Gallery of Canada in Ottawa, which is the coldest capital in the world, a very Nordic city. Uh, it's Gothic, neo-Gothic tradition is 
informs much of the public buildings. You can see Parliament on the right side and on the left, the National Gallery facing the Ottawa River next to the cathedral. And our thought was again to find a way to resonate with the Nordic city, with a cold climate, with its Gothic tradition, and create a very transparent, inviting, contemporary building which has this kind of dialogue with its historic past. And again, this was in search of specificity of place, how to make a design that really feels belonging to that place. I would not build this building in Dubai. I wouldn't even build it in Beijing or Shanghai. It is very much in the character of Canada and Ottawa as it evolved. The dome of the Great Hall with its transformative shading system. One of the great challenges in the sense of an architecture which, which belongs was a commission to design the National Museum of the Sikhs in Punjab, in India, near Chandigarh, the famous city designed by Le Corbusier. And this occurred when the Prime Minister of the Punjab visited the Holocaust Museum in Jerusalem, which we designed. And he was very moved by the experience of the architecture and invited us to come and design the National Museum. I was taken on my first trip to the uh, Golden Temple in Amritsar, which is the holiest place for the Sikh people. And I saw the tradition of water, uh, of landscaping, of an architecture, but that has a whole sense of ritual. And the question was, could we capture the spirit of Sikh architecture and Sikh traditions and Sikh uh, culture uh, with a new contemporary building designed by someone who is not a Sikh? who has to learn about that culture as an outsider. Uh, this is a site uh, adjacent to a very important religious location, a site of the fortress in which the last guru of the Sikhs uh, died as a martyr. It spans the valley on both sides. Uh, these are some of the sketches which I made after my first visit of the design which includes on the left side, my memory of the fortress city of Jaisalmer in, the, in Rajasthan, which to me represented this tradition of building on, on the sand cliffs in a very arid environment in that tradition. And this is the model, first model we presented, where we dammed the valley to become a series of water gardens we built several structures on both sides of the valley, bridging with a pedestrian bridge between the auditorium and library that serve the town and the museum of history that across. And this was a fascinating process because you realized even during the groundbreaking where hundreds of thousands of people appeared that this is a project of national importance that it has a great deal to do with the Sikh identity. Uh, this is the building as it was uh, realized 10 years later, uh, set in the valley. The structures are concrete, uh, which is today the dominant building material, but they are clad in sandstone, a Gawalir local stone, which has been part of the tradition of the place, but it's integrated with uh, concrete structures, the arcades, and also with stainless steel roofs, which kind of echo the roof structures of the Gurdwaras, which are usually white and sometimes silver, but kind of as an inverse. It took some doing to bring this new technology to the site. Uh, we got companies from different parts of India to collaborate, to be able to build stainless steel roofs and this kind of sophisticated structure, but it is completely embraced by the Sikh community today as kind of one of the spiritual centers 
of the community. Uh, it has an extensive series of exhibits within it, which recall the story of Sikh history and culture. And in fact, it has since then been the subject of expansion as demand has risen. I'm going to show you a very different contrasting project because again, it will show to what extent place is a factor and a force in how we conceive buildings. You could see that stylistically, if you looked at it at face value, the building in Ottawa, the National Gallery, the building uh, in India uh, were very different. And I'm gonna show you a museum that we designed some years ago and are currently even expanding, the Crystal Bridges Museum of American Art which is located in a small town in the middle of the United States in the state of Arkansas. It's a small town with a beautiful landscape estate in which we chose to build in the valley itself. The area that you see in the center is where we are building, we built the museum right in the stream bed rather than build it on the hilltops where we would have had to destroy many trees. There's a tradition of mill towns in the United States where old towns were built on the water in order to deploy or take advantage of water power to power the machines and the mills, etc. And we went with this tradition of saying we could form some ponds by damming the stream and around the ponds. Uh, which is just a natural flow of water, we would build the museum in a series of pavilions, which you see in one of my early sketches, a, a, a group of pavilions that sort of straddle, bridge across the water and sit around the water. And we went further and said, given the local construction tradition of timber, we will make this museum primarily of concrete and wood, except we would go further in the way we use wood. We would use it in a very highly technological way, expanding the possibilities of it. The building, as you see it here, has been uh, functioning for several years. It has, it, it has been a, a, a great draw for the community. Uh, you can see here the sophist sophisticated laminated wood beam structures, which are supported by a series of cables, which span across the pond. So they float almost uh, uh, magically, uh, but you have the warmth and the efficiency and the sustainability of the wood. Um, the uh, structures connect nature and art so as you experience the museum, you are constantly out in nature and back in the galleries. So you've got this uh, internalized space with art and nature back and forth as you move through the museum. And the structure itself, which is literally a series of dams and suspension bridges crossing the water and containing within them galleries and other facilities. Um, the museum has been so successful that we are currently uh, expanding it. And uh, here you see the great expansion of almost doubling the museum in size, which is currently under construction. So what we've seen here is architecture of wood, architecture with stone and concrete, uh, architecture crystalline and with glass, each responding to its place and culture. And this is a process which I believe can give us the pleasure of place instead of the sameness that comes with globalization. But as an architectural um, attitude or posture, I would say it demands for the architect to be attentive to place, to have the antennas out to understand the place, to try and decipher the secrets of the site that are particular rather than general. 
it's almost the opposite of what used to be called the international style. And it's certainly opposite of the concept of the signature style. Signature style is okay if you build in one place, in one culture, uh, as we used to in the past. But today, we are building, uh, as architects, in many countries, in many cultures, many of them not even our own. Finally, I just want to talk about the public realm and relate that to Marina Bay Sands, which in many ways was a breakthrough project for us in terms of our work in Asia. When we were first approached to participate in the competition for Marina Bay, uh, it was not the casino and the notion of an integrated resort that interested me, but the fact that this was a mixed use dense urban development in which we could demonstrate how to design an exemplary public realm. And I was optimistic that we could achieve this in part because the Urban Redevelopment Authority of Singapore, who were the overseeing agency, had very much the same objective. Singapore has been committed to developing a very vital and powerful public realm, and they try and introduce this to private developers. And here was an opportunity to take the program of shopping, shops, museum, theater, convention, uh, hotels, uh, an ideal program for a mixed-use project, and show how you could create a public realm that's in part outdoors, uh, connected with nature and the water, in part indoors, in part open to um, open to the elements, uh, in part air conditioned. You get the best of both worlds, where you can migrate during the day or during the seasons. Also, to demonstrate that you could create public realm on various levels, on the roofs of the podium, on the Sky Park atop the 59 story hotel towers, all of which extend public life into various levels of the dense city. I think this is the future of urbanism to think of towers three dimensionally, to think of the potential of connecting them and linking them and creating a series of experiences at various levels of the city. And the great lesson and excitement of Marina Bay was to actually see a sky park uh, filled with public facilities of restaurants and parks and swimming pools and observatories become so focal of such a focal point for the city of Singapore. This kind of exploration continued when we had the opportunity to work on Raffle City in Chongqing. Again, we were faced with a very important historic site, the heart of downtown facing Chiantamen Square, which is a historic place, the Emperor's Landing, where the city was first born. The symbolic impact was undeniable. But also there was an interesting challenge. You could see that our site in red separated two parts of the city, the downtown streets on one side with the square or the plaza that faces the Jialing and um, the Nyangtze rivers as they merge at this point uh, in the geography of central China. And this image reminds us that the Emperor's Landing, uh, going back in history, right on that very site, uh, was a pivotal spot in terms of the evolution, not only of Chongqing, but of the entire region. And so I thought that the mixed use complex of 10, of one, more than 1 million square meters should evoke part of that marine history that this was a place of ships and of uh, the port and loading and unloading 
And this sense of a series of towers, which form the kind of a prow of a ship, dynamically moving downriver, seemed to us like an appropriate inspiration. But the bigger challenge was also how do we weave the project into the city? You see here the translation of the sketch into the cluster of towers as they face the river. But the question is, how do we weave this program, including 200,000 square meters of retail, into the street, in a, into the city in a powerful way? We, how many malls have we seen that turn their back to the city and sort of isolate themselves with just minimal entrances to get you in? Once you're in, you don't know even how to get out. And in this particular case, we thought the answer is to reroute the traffic, see, you, which you see in red, to the periphery street and to let the major pedestrian streets that are running north-south through the downtown of Chongqing to extend through the project and connect to the piazza. We were drawing on a great tradition of great gallerias like the Victoria, famous Victoria Manuel Galleria in Milan, which does connect two very powerful places in Milan, the Duomo Plaza by the cathedral and the Scala Piazza by the Opera House. It goes from point to point, while at the same time providing an amazing environment for the city. And so in that same way, we extended, you see here in red, descending from the upper city to the piazza, the streets right through the complex. At the same time, being at the high level coming from downtown, we created a great public park open to the public 24 hours a day on the roof of the podium, which is a gift to the city of Chongqing uh, made possible by the development. Finally, we introduced the, con the conservatory, uh, which floats uh, above the residential towers, another level of the public realm expanding across four towers with public facilities. And so here is the park as you ascend into it from the city. The uh, variety of spaces and fountains and playgrounds as they overlook the piazza. Within, as the streets move through, you're able to see through to the towers above and descend step by step as you move towards the plaza, being very much in line with the city streets as an extension of them. And finally, uh, overseeing the great rivers, uh, the uh, conservatory as it floats above with its observation deck, with its varied programs of restaurants and pools and clubs and hotel lobbies. As you see here, another dimension, another level of public realm uh, on the 50th level of the complex with its gardens in the observatory with its swimming pools and athletics facilities. And finally, the city facing the plaza and the rivers and the shipping uh, center as a kind of thrust, uh, having already become very much the kind of anchor and, and, and one of the symbols of Chongqing. And I'd like to conclude with one more project, which essentially took all this a step further, which is the Jewel complex of Changi Airport. The program for the Jewel was to facilitate some expansion of the terminal spaces, that is airport facilities, together with a major retail complex, which would be serving both the city citizens, the, 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 the public at large, and the passengers and employees of the airport. But also the program called for an attraction. And the question is what kind of attraction? And we concluded that this attraction should not be a kind of a theme park, dinosaurs or mummies or something like that, 
but a timeless attraction that would attract people of all ages. And we thought of creating a magical garden, a magical garden full of activities, which complements the bazaar-like marketplace of the shopping and the airport facilities. And I think what we stumbled on, you see here the climatic systems and how it is responding to providing enough sunlight for the plants uh, and comfort for the people. Uh, I, can't, I won't go into the details, but you see here the finished product. And the magic of Jewel has been to all of a sudden realize that in the heart of a city, you can create intense shopping and all the facilities we associate with malls and downtown and the hustle bustle together with a great experience of nature. And they can coexist side by side with the rainfall becoming a great event to drain through the structure. And with, you see here, the, the drainage of the roof coming right through all the way to the lowest basement levels and bringing in daylight with it. And the cohabitation of the shopping and the shops and all that comes with it together with nature and integrated into kind of fun things for people, walks on nets and other installations and restaurants that open into the garden. And to me, this has set a new standard that we can in the heart of cities today, start thinking of the public realm as the integration of the marketplace and nature. And if we can achieve that, then the dense city, the mega city, I think has a chance of being humanized and breaking away from the dehumanizing trend that it has been following for several decades now. And I think with this note, the importance of daylight in the public realm, the importance of nature, the, the, our ability to integrate them. Uh, I would like to conclude this talk and turn it over to questions and discussion. Thank you. See you soon. Thank you so much, sir. It's a very uh, great and fruitful uh, presentation and with very astonishing images and your uh, 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 so, uh, we have now a very plenty of time to discuss and also to uh, answer some questions. And I think to start the, the discussion uh, section, and I will um, raise two questions from the developer of the REPL uh, city in Chongqing. And I think the first question is, so uh, REPL city Chongqing is a large, mixed use complex. Did you start the design with this commercial demands or potential to of becoming a landmark building and how you process this uh, initial uh, concept uh, of the project in Chongqing? I think one has to remember that a, a design of a complex uh, responds to different forces and at different times. In the first phase, this was a competition. Um, Capital Land came to us and explained that the city had made a competition for the site and it was unhappy with the results. And therefore, uh, they thought we should submit a design, a new design that maybe this, the city leaders would like. But the city responded in saying, we cannot do that without another competition. And so there was another competition which we participated in. In that second competition, there were some statements by the city that they thought this is a very important landmark project, it has to be very significant, uh, uh, iconic landmark. They also spoke about having a singular tower one tower in its, in its center as a primary attraction. 
So I joined with Kaplan, and when I looked at the site and studied it, I understood that we need to come up with a symbolic project, but I thought that a single tower was a wrong solution for the site because a site, by definition, is a gateway. It is the entrance to the city, in a way. And a single tower is not welcoming. So I thought it should be a pair of towers because they are welcoming. And I thought connecting it with the theme of sailboats and making all the towers somehow together have a powerful expression be, that goes beyond the individual towers in, in the form of connecting them with the conservatory would give it a very powerful differentiation from just the usual cluster of high-rise buildings. So I was conscious of the need to come up with something that has a powerful presence, symbolic presence. At the same time, Capital Land is a commercial developer and their concern is to make everything work and to make everything profitable. And so the apartments have to be sellable and affordable and the retail needs to work as they conceive a mall to be. And it's interesting that there were some interesting, uh, uh, there were tensions about certain issues. For example, initially, Capital Land wanted us to make the roof of the podium where all the cars arrive and uh, make the drop-offs and entrances to the towers. And I resisted because I felt it would be better to have the cars go under so that we could make a public park out of the roof. If it's all cars and traffic, the roof becomes wasted in terms of its potential. And it took about four or five months of discussions to demonstrate that it was a better way to go that way. So that we did have our very uh, uh, intense but enriching discussions about some issues. But because I think we are advocates for the public realm, this helped a lot to achieve the kind of uh, design that, uh, that we, we ended up with. Thank you so much for the for the answer. And the second question uh, on behalf of the, uh, the Ruffle client, um, one of the most important programs in Ruffle City, Chongqing, is uh, a residential area named Chaotian Port. I think it's named after the Chaotianmen Port. And what is the initial thought of the lifestyle for the future residents that you envisioned at the beginning of the design? So when we got the program, we realized that it would be a mix of family housing and more small units for, for individuals. Um, it's, it's a kind of a mix so that you would have some apartments that, that should have big, big terraces and balconies and others uh, would be more compact. Uh, we designed the tower so that on both the north and south end are all balcony and terrace spaces. Uh, and we designed them in a way that all apartments always have two orientations. That is in terms of making the apartments attractive and full of light and maximizing the views. But we also saw an opportunity to give them common amenities in two places, all the apartment buildings have gardens and private swimming pools on the roof of the podium, uh, together with the public park. In addition to that, there is that very exciting club in the conservatory with a swimming pool and gymnasium and party rooms, which is available to all the residents. So that there are, there are several opportunities for them for this kind of rich public life and amenities, which are uh, quite rare. Uh, at the same time, they've got the whole convenience of being next to a hotel and shopping downstairs with anything that they need. So it's, it's the best of urban life with benefiting from the extraordinary location 
because every one of those towers is looking either up the Yangtze or up the Jieling or onto the mountains. I mean, unbelievable views that they, that they all enjoy. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Uh, totally agree because uh, I just been to Chongqing like a few few weeks ago. Uh, I visit a lot of places in Chongqing. That actually is the second time for me to visit Chongqing. And then uh, it's very very inspiring. Uh, very uh, inspiring and also enlightening to me because when I went to there's a temple uh, across the river, and I think that's the best point. To, to to visit or to to, yeah. to see the to see the tower, and I think this is link, linking to to my um, next question because I noticed that uh, you used the word "ran" for several times in your presentation, and which word? The, which word? Uh, the, the, the ram ram r e a l m and uh, ram this word is very uh, to me is very interesting because. Uh, for example, in Chongqing, also in in Marina Bay in Singapore, I think that is how one complex um, or just one building or a design can alter or create space of spirit in some place which is attached to attached to some uh, specific culture or vernacular lifestyle, especially in Chongqing. Because in Chongqing, they have a lot of mountains, they have rivers, they have very uh, multiple experience of the of the uh, uh, of the line of the landmark. And to me, I think the Rapple Tower they create um, a different, a, con a contemporary atmosphere or, or spirit of Ram in, in in Chongqing. So my question is, what is the word Ram? Uh, is it is, is this word have some uh, very special uh, meaning to you, or have some special um, functional uh, design uh, methodology to you about this this word? Uh, it it uh, tempts me to look up the word in the dictionary and <laughs> see exactly what it says. Uh, can you look up realm in in the dictionary, please? Because uh, we we say public realm. Uh, realm, I think, comes has a royal. Let's see. Field of domain of activity of interest. Primary. You check the biogeographical division of the Earth's surface. Mm, we're getting here very. What does mean realm? Okay. Spirit domain. Okay. So the, the thank you. The dictionary is not so helpful in the sense that <laughs> it gives you the kind of more geographic realm is an environment, a place, uh, well-defined uh, place. But we say public realm, meaning there's the private place in the city, your house, your, where you work, there's the semi, like a place of worship. Uh, yeah. A concert hall is, is public, but, but, but semi-public. But then there's the public realm, the street, the piazza, in the Greek city, the agora, uh, yeah. in, the, in, the, in the Roman city, the forum. In, uh, in the medieval city, it was the, the big public square uh, where public life goes on. And we, even a hundred years ago, had a rich public realm. The streets uh, of the older cities were wonderful places. You think of Paris and the Champs Elysees and, and the various boulevards. Uh, there were places of pride and places of identity and, and places with shops and everything the city needed. And in the, in the 21st century, with the automobile and congestion and pollution, uh, everything is run, run into the inside and privatized. So malls are not public realm. Malls are private shopping places. And they're designed and conceived like that. So I say the mall is not the answer. The mall is passé, it's finished. It was a transition, but climate protection 
People want some pl- private, uh, climate protection. They want to be connected to nature. On a beautiful spring day, you don't want to be in air conditioning. On a very cold day in, uh, say, Montreal, you want to be in a place that's protected. Yeah. So can we have places that have transition, both day, winter, summer, uh, daylight, uh, with nature in them. And I think in Joule, we struck, we struck uh, kind of, as we say in English, the jackpot, uh, where you're in the casino, you, yeah, you, yeah. you get the jackpot, that, that we discovered something new in Joule, that we, did, we, we were dreaming, maybe it's possible, but we didn't know till it was built, that you could have just an amazing place that feels like you're in the woods, like you're in the mountains and water and plants and the smell of the plants and the sun coming in and you have shopping and you have airport facilities and everything works together. Uh, This was a wonderful discovery of what the public realm can be going forward. But we need to have pride of public realm. And in many cities, certainly in North America, People have lost the pride and care of the public realm, and it needs to be restored. We need to take possession. Yeah, because I think the, the, the world realm, they bring, bring about some different feeling or different, um, because, uh, because when, well, in the, the classic theory of, of the place, of the, of the space, and I think this world realm is, uh, you're really linking to some religious or some uh, worship places, but I think in 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 the in the contemporary cases, like like in the uh, commercial complex or also the Changi Airport, I think this is place where the modern people or the contemporary people where they gathering, they they worship. It's not worship, but they they have a very strong feeling for the mayor, some development. Uh, like like in Singapore or in a lot of cities in China, uh, this is a real contemporary public life. So I, I I do learn a lot from your from your thing. I think this is very important to to the contemporary design, especially in China, because um, now the public life is very the, the most uh, significant significant issue to to the urban planning or the urban design. So I think that's um linking to the to the to the Changi airport uh, like I mentioned before the the, the presentation uh, that's the last time before the academic that I can travel abroad I think um, I'm, I'm very lucky I choose Singapore as the destination for for travel and to spend the the a new year eve I spent a new year eve in the marina Marina Bay, uh, in the in the it's not casino, but in the in the bar in the rooftop. Pretty good, uh, great. Yeah, but I lost a lot a lot of money in casino. <laughs> and uh, my question, next question is, um, how do you think the the contemporary infrastructure as a um, like a vital uh, space for for public activity or public events because to me i think the jewel i think uh, Changi airport is a um, to me it's a po- poetic uh, spect- a spectacle that can attract people and to um, provide a very great uh, infrastructure and provide very great public space for different people different people from different uh, country from different different regions from different cultures from different uh, religions even and what is the new infrastructure in your design to redefine like the terminal or like the train station? Uh, what's the difference between the jewel and also the, uh, the same like uh, ordinary uh, infrastructure? Well, it's interesting to think back about the competition uh, for jewel. Um, the the airport shortlisted uh, four developers for the project and each developer had their own architect and each developer got the same program from the airport Um, and one proposal doesn't i don't need to use names but one proposal 
looked very much like a mall. You know, it was a, a commercial mall building uh, and the attraction were dinosaurs, a kind of a theme park dinosaur. So when you think about it, this was the sort of common answer. A mall, shopping mall, and attraction dinosaurs. So it could be, if not dinosaurs, like the mall of Dubai, a swimming pool, or uh, a ski, a ski run, you know, some something unusual kind of attraction. But uh, we took a different direction. We said uh, an attraction needs to be timeless. It needs to be something that doesn't get dated. It needs to be something which Monumental. uplifts us, you know, uplifts us. And what is more uplifting and an attraction? And they said, oh, well, we have already parks. We have gardens by the bay. We have botanical gardens. We don't need another garden. Well, we always need another garden. There's no end to, this is why the culture, garden of paradise, Par gar garden is paradise. Uh, and I think there are equivalents in Asian cultures as well of the garden of well-being. So we took a different approach, but it's, it would be interesting to now speculate how we would go about it in a new opportunity, say in downtown Shanghai. I think what's important to recognize is that the public realm cannot just be shopping. It's not enough. Yep. We, need, we need culture, we need entertainment, and we need institutions, libraries, even a courthouse. Uh, we, need, we need the kind of mix that brings different people for different reasons. In the airport, we have it because everybody is there wanting either to fly or working there or coming from the city or visiting. We have a good mix. The mix is important of program and of, uh, of people. And I think it also has to be very extrovert. It has to be open. It should not feel... I mean, Jewel is unusual because it's sealed. But... That's because of being in the airport. If Jewel was in the middle of a city, it would be very important that the streets flow in like we did in Chongqing, that it, it expands out, not, not closed in. I think these are the kind of prerequisites for a place that you want to say public realm. Yeah, I think... And especially, uh, I think in your design, you are very sensitive and you have a lot of, uh, I mean, um, very amazing things happen in the, in, because of climate in Singapore, in Chongqing, or in Qinghuangdao, in different regions, you have different situation of climate, of the, of the, of the weather, of the, of the human um, of the air. And, um, uh, maybe in Boston, like we mentioned, because uh, in, 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 in summer of Boston, it's, it's like a paradise. It's very, everything is great and sunshine. Uh, I spent a year, by the way, I spent a year in, in Harper Jesse. Um, I, I, I do enjoy the, 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 the summer in, in Boston, but like winter, it's always pretty big, uh, pretty heavy. And how you how deal with the different uh, region with different climates? Um, because I think you, men you mentioned the public space and the public space with with balcony with with open space to the air to the to the nature, and how you deal with the uh, climate issues. You know, one of the important, the most difficult uh, to deal with are the climates which have very contrasting seasons. If you're designing uh, in Singapore, is always the same tropical yep. hot. The only difference in Singapore is between daytime and nighttime. Big difference. So in Singapore, the you design so people can move and enjoy nighttime being outside, daytime being protected. It's like the desert. In the desert, you need shelter during the day. But at night, it's usually very beautiful. You know, you want to be outside. 
So it's an architecture of in and out on a daily cycle. But in climates like Boston and much of Europe, where you have hot summers, cold winters, and very beautiful transitions, is where we have the biggest challenge yet to solve, how you make an architecture that's almost convertible. Like I have a car, at winter I have the roof closed, insulation, heater, and as soon as the sun comes out, nice day, I press the button, roof opens, I have beautiful convertible. Architecture has to be like that. Architecture has to be like my convertible car. Ideally, that you can open up like a day like today and here, and then on a snowstorm, you have protection and cover, and that the architecture must, even facades of office buildings, facades of office buildings should be like organic because it's like the leaves of a tree. They should open up and let the sun in on beautiful winter days, but you want shade in the middle of summer. And so you want something that, that has an organic transformation uh, through the hours of the day and the seasons. And I think that's the next chapter in architecture, new materials, new technologies that allow you to do that. And since I'm 83, that's the agenda for the next generation. Yes, now in China, we have a lot of uh, research program uh, now uh, focusing on the like changeable uh, material of facade, in the, especially in the commercial uh, towers. And also uh, in, especially in Canada or in America or like Russia or China have a very big uh, territory of the, of the country. They have very uh, 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 dramatic change of the, of the different climate or different regions. I think it is a very great issue to, to deal with. Um, due, to, due to the, like, like today, we, we, we have to, we have now no chance to, to sit together to have this lecture uh, because of the pandemic. And um, I, I noticed there is a report uh, during the uh, pandemic uh, quarantine in, in Canada and some uh, uh, a young guy living in Habitat uh, 67, and he felt very lucky because he lived in 67. And once um, he, he can have, a, have his guaranteed life, and also he can enjoy the outdoor space of the, of the, of the building. And um, how do you think, the, or what is your image about the drilling uh, in the future, especially when we are now uh, in court, um, we are now facing some very uh, uh, dramatic uh, global issue like the like the, the COVID nineteen or things like that. And how? What is your image about the future uh, residential uh, building or 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 drilling uh, in your uh, image? I think during COVID, where people were restricted to their house, we learned how uh, inadequate a lot of housing is, urban housing particularly. Those who lived in private houses, they had their garden, they could go outside, they could breathe air, they could uh, do exercise, they could go jogging. But those who lived in apartments, uh, you know, I have friends who lived in very expensive apartments, but you can't open the window. Uh, you know, these towers have just little little slots to open. And if you're stuck there for days, it is very, uh, very depressing. Uh, so we learned during COVID how important it is to be able to incorporate outside space and opening windows and more connection with nature uh, because people were not able to just go out and, and be in the, in, the, in the country or the park. But I think we also learned how it's important to create good places to be together. Uh, because we missed, we realized how much, you know, people said, oh, the future of work is from home. I think we learned the opposite. 
you can work from home when you have to, if you're on a computer, you can't work from home if you're a bus driver uh, but, or a pilot, but you can work from home if you are working on a computer, but uh, you miss the contact day-to-day, face-to-face, discussion, uh, stimulation, uh, cross-fertilization. I think that is uh, something we've learned from COVID. How important yeah, it is. Especially, yeah. especially for the architect. And we, we, I think we are in between of like a pilot or, or, or some uh, yeah. um, career we have to work together. We, we uh, at one hand, we have to work together like a teamwork and with different um, um, engineering, electricity, and material yeah, space. Absolutely. And, but we, we can also do some drawing and do some computer work at home. So I think it's very interesting because uh, now a lot of um, like design studios, we are now trying or, or, or uh, uh, try very hard to, to, to feed the, the future of the, of the quarantine or like in Shanghai or in Beijing, the mega city, they are in a high risk of the, especially the, the, the um, international creation of the, of the virus. Uh, so now um, I, I, I'm, I'm honored to behalf the one audience to ask a question. And the audience asked, we heard that you talk a lot of, a lot of the projects in India, in Canada, or in North America, um, or in Asia. I think it reflects the regional uh, features of the uh, particular uh, region. So I would like to ask Mr. Safadi, how do you think Chinese culture can be embodied in architecture, uh, architectural forms, especially the contemporary uh, architecture? Uh, I understand that question. Say, how do we capture the specificity of Chinese culture in in a building in China? Well, it is a complex question, and it's I would say it's even too general to say in China. China is a big country. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Hainan uh, is very different uh, from being uh, in the north. Uh, yeah, Beijing <laughs> and Beijing and even more north and the mountains and uh, the middle of the country is very different and the Silk Road is very different. So China is many cultures. I know it's one culture, but it's many cultures, many climates and even different vernacular traditions. I had the good opportunity, unusual opportunity to travel through the country in 1973. So 1973 was before the big high rise in all the cities. I don't think there was one high rise building in Beijing or in Shanghai then, except maybe the the Bund. And you could see what a diverse country it was. So when in building in China, I think you have you have to understand the region and the climate and the lifestyle in the region. When we did the design for Namok, the National Museum of Art in Beijing, which we did not win, but we spent oh, you mean much Namok? time. Namok, uh, yeah. Namok, yeah. yeah. Uh, Namok, I also yeah. participated in the in the competition <laughs> while so working in America. <laughs> we worked in we worked on it for for two years because there were three phases. We went. We were in the finalist phase. Uh, I, th- I think the finalist was uh, Zaha Hadid. Nouvelle, uh, Frank Harry, uh, and, yeah. uh, and us. And so we were thinking, you know, in a particular way um, and different inspirations when we were uh, doing, uh, again, another competition we did not win uh, for a museum in Shanghai or a science center in Guangzhou. Um, they were very much of the region. Uh, funnily enough, or sadly for us, in those several institutional competitions, we were not successful. Um, but each of them for us was an opportunity to try and understand the place. Now, how, what do you have to look for? It's too complex. You, it's, a, it's a complex process. It's, it's planning, 
its climate, its materials, its the surrounding setting. Are you in nature? Are you in, in the middle of the city? So it's, I would say it's multiple sensibilities. Yes, yes. Uh, because to me, uh, my point of view, um, because the Chinese culture is, is a sophisticated, uh, uh, like a cluster concept of, of the, of the, just one culture because it's not it's very it's very different from different regions in China and they have very total different culture and climates and the vernacular lifestyle and also the um, how the urban was, was developed so I think the uh, I think it's the same to to North America culture or European culture or India culture or Chinese culture we have to uh, when we are the architects we have to deal with the sophisticated issues uh, in terms of different projects. I think the best way to, to, to respect the sophisticated, you have to admit that it's very sophisticated. And then yes. you, have, you can now dig into the, the, the particular design. And I uh, mentioned, the, as I mentioned, Memo, uh, in 2012, I was working with Frank Gary. Um, we also, uh, Take some part of the design, but we all have no uh, the, the the results. So um, I, told, uh, I, I I shared with Frank our design, and he shared his design with us. Uh, <laughs> it was interesting to compare; they were very very different. Yeah, it's uh, very different. Uh, Frank, see, Frank put a lot of effort into the into the project. So did we? I promise you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. By the way, I, I would like. To, to introduce uh, the founder of, of DesignWire, uh, also my uh, my friend, uh, Jessica Ma, to give some uh, word. Uh, Jessica? Hi. Uh, thank you so much for today's presentation, Mr. Safudi. We are very honored to have you. Okay, as it's working. Yes, for Master Talk. So, yeah, thank you. And have a great day. We wish you. Thank you very much. Greetings to everyone. Yes, okay, see you next time. Uh,好的,再次感谢Safdiu,在这一个多小时的时间里给我们分享了他的设计概念和思想。我最后做一个简单的总结,要谢谢同时要谢谢我们的主持人浩德,教授,另外还要特别感谢今天的两位同传的翻译,本身是Safdi就是事务所的他的同事。我就翻译的非常非常的棒 那在整个的这个分享过程里面，我留意到了三个很有特色的项。第一个是金沙呃酒店，其实在这个呃就是高密度的城市下，我觉得呃就是他讲到了一个非常重要的点，就不断去激发城市的活力，呃把一些购物中
呃，中国的非常地标性的一个项目，同时我们会觉得，就是什么才能算是一个好的一个住宅的一个概念来讲，我自己也深有一个体会，就是你可以在一公里以内，你可以体验到的各种不同的这种需求，也许是住宅的，也许是酒店的，也许是餐饮的、娱乐的等等等等。但是你想想，如果在一个一栋的建筑里面，或者几栋建筑里面融合在一起，有购物中心。有商场，有酒店，有商业等等，其实它无形里面是解决了很多的一些你的生活的诉求。我觉得它可能跟住在一个郊远的地方，它的感受是完全不一样的。那我觉得这也是一个不同的生活方式的一种体现。所以最后我也呃想告诉大家一个特别好的消息，就是呃就是重庆的这个来福士项目在最新的这个豪宅，其实它有一千五百平的平层，也是我觉得是突破了在北京的。九百平平层的一个概念，然后马上要开放了，其实是一个特别好的消息，也可以让大家去慢慢去体验一下。那今天呢，我们觉得最后要呃特别感谢萨福迪，嗯、呃，他其实呃今年八十多岁了哈，然后能够把自己这种呃非常有激情的这种思想，非非常有深度的一些概念，能够分享给大家，嗯、呃，再次感谢。也希望大家能够更多的关注设计文化大师说，我们是从建筑、景观、室内，然后灯光等等，然后邀请了很多的不同的全世界的设计师。今天也是二十七，呃，非常感谢所有的开发商的朋友的关注，所有的设计师的关注，呃，再次感谢大家，谢谢。